Good evening and assalamu alaikum. Uh, to our uh, respected listeners, welcome once again to this installment of the IPSA seminar series. Uh, IPSA is the International Peace College South Africa and I'm its principal, Ihsan Talib. Uh, of the seminar series conducted uh, in the institution, uh, one of our recent ones uh, focused on the issue of the understandings of caliphate given the geopolitical uh, events in the Muslim world as well as looking at some of the complexities from a geopolitical perspective that are unfolding as we speak in that part of the world. To make sense of these um, uh, events in the world and for ourselves here in South Africa, as well as for the Muslim community, we invite specialists, we invite global thought leaders, and one such global thought leader whom we have with us uh, this, of this evening is none other than Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul, uh, who joined uh, those discussions uh, in IPSA very recently. We say to Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul, Assalamu Alaikum and welcome to the show. Wa Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum and to your listeners and your viewers and thank you very much for being, for having me on Dean TV. Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul, um, uh, the, the, the issue of course very pertinent, uh, very uh, confusing to many of us. I think uh, we can probably at this juncture not spend enough time in trying to crystallize um, what are some of the more strategic, what are some of the more uh, guidance and wisdom uh, that we need to follow uh, in the current uh, scenario that we are facing. And so uh, in our discussions in the previous chapter and the previous uh, episode, we were obviously looking at the need for the Muslims to consider uh, this particular, uh, let's say, interval or pause uh, politically as you have elucidated on it, uh, to reflect inwardly, to see how we position and strategize uh, towards a far more composed, a far more considered and uh, strategically wise um, posturing by the Muslim Ummah itself. I think one of the very important uh, reflections that we made was for us to, as we do that in internal and in, uh, towards ourselves reflection, to look on uh, the contextual considerations uh, of our sources, uh, the uh, uh, references in the Holy Quran, the references in the very history of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, himself, as well as those far more uh, pertinent aspects of his seerah or his history that also saw him, um, of course, creating alliances uh, with strategic partners within the building of a uh, not only a city but a state within Al Medina uh, or the Medina state uh, that really begins to look at the values, look at the masalih, the interest, uh, those things which human beings uh, really want to establish for themselves within their normal everyday lives. A very important, and going further with this contextual, I think, evaluation, a very important tool uh, that, of course, also our uh, strategist rely on is the tool of the maqasid, the higher purposes of the sharia and those things of course um, I think um, uh, uh, manifesting themselves in the preservation of, of faith, the preservation of life itself, the preservation of intellect, preservation of wealth, preservation of property of, of, of human society, uh, dignity is very important and the family in, in essence. Those are the kind of major high level considerations uh, obviously from a shari'i but also a maqasidi uh, approach as a strategy uh, going forward. Uh, Ambassador Ibrahim, um, the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in terms of his own strategic alliances which he forged uh, in the city of al Madinah, we mentioned the last time around uh, the existence and the security that was guaranteed for people of different faiths when al Madinah. We spoke about the Jews who were citizens in the state of al Madinah. We spoke about the Christians who were citizens, equal citizens, in the city of al Madinah. And you mentioned about how those became the normative um, values that begin to obviously uh, shed light on how we go forward, as opposed to those exceptional cases which must be viewed within those contextual uh, kind of uh, uh, appraisers, uh, to appraise it from a context and evaluating it from a contextual perspective. Uh, Ambassador Ibrahim, if we look at this as probably one of, probably an Achilles heel within the Muslim Ummah, one of the bugbears for the Muslim Ummah today, it is to manage those differences, to manage the 
and maybe even to mobilize and to actually begin to uh, 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 draw on the strengths of the differences within society as opposed to really looking only with you know suspicion and with uh, a sense of uh, contempt at those who manifest in different ways how uh, ambassador ibrahim should we perhaps look in this interregnum in this interval phase as you have alluded to towards uh, you know, mobilizing differences, then also, uh, I think, um, strategizing uh, for, for, for differences as being a, a strength, perhaps, rather than a threat uh, to the Muslim community. You know, I think that <clears throat> the great strength of Muslims is that they are very grounded in their principles and their values. Mm. The great strengths of Muslims are often their ability to be absolutely cunning on the tactics that they need to use on day to day. Mm. The great weakness of the Ummah is their strategic sense of how to connect their tactics with their objectives. Mm. And so in our moments of anger and extremism and so forth, we can contradict our principles through our tactical actions. And so when someone offends us, we are prepared to kill and therefore negate the preservation of life. Mm. When bigotry enters our mind, we are prepared to deny women education against the preservation of the intellect. Mm. And so we can go on and show the mismatch often between the daily tactical actions of Muslims that are in contradiction to the maqasid or the intents of faith itself and, 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 and so the strategic purpose or the purpose that we have is to restore the strategic you see that those who are good tacticians see down the road those who are good strategists see around the corners mm. those who are good tacticians see what is now those who are good strategic thinkers see what is going to come later and, and the Prophet وسلم, was able to be a strategic thinker. He allowed Salman al-Farsi to determine the tactics for Khandaq. Mm. He mm. called mm. on people at Badr to say, give me your advice. How shall we, where shall we position our forces? And they said, on the hill. Mm. So he delegated. The Prophet Sallallahu delegated a lot of the tactical decisions but he remained the master of the strategic because he was most in touch with the objectives and the intents and the maqasid. Mm. And therefore at, at Hudaybiyah he took control through the inspiration of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala he took control of the situation mm. even against the master tactician Sayyidina Umar radiallahu mm. And he said, no, this is what, that the revelation from Allah is that I'm, we must add faith to our faith, that Allah promises us a greater victory. Mm. And so the, so the point about strategic planning is that when you know your destination, you can work out the road towards it. And sometimes we all know the little streets that will get us to the highway and the highway is the, is the strategy, the streets are the tactics and the destination is where we want to end up. And so all of that means that we need to restore that capacity within the Ummah if we are going to go anywhere and we don't have to depart from the pages of the Quran or the examples from the Seerah in order to find how we can do this. Because the Quran is full of how to restore the strategic ability of, mm. of, 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 of Muslims and so is, mm. so is the seerah. Now I think the application of this in the world today is in the re-adoption of the Maqasidi approach. Now I believe that the Maqasidi approach is inherent in all that we have inherited from the usulul fiqh and the fiqh and 
all the Sharia that is there, the Maqasid approach is inherent in it mm. because for you to be able to do Qiyas, mm. you needed to understand the objective or by or, or fit through analogy. You needed to understand the essence or the objective of a ruling or mm. a practice by the Prophet Sallallahu or the early um, um, jurists and then transfer that essence to another country, another climate, another community, another time, mm. and another space. Mm. And then preserve the essence of that one ruling and bring it there. And so, for example, if we had lived with the first um, period of khayyid, of menstruation for women, we'd probably all be having women out of action for 15 days mm. a month. Whereas, taking the essence of it, we could understand that in that climate it could be seven days. Mm. In that climate it may be five days. Mm. And so we didn't tie ourselves up to the rule, mm. we transported mm. the objective across time and space. Mm. And so, <clears throat> in much the same way, we could be calling all the Indo-Pak Muslims kafir, because they are not wearing a thobe. Mm. But because we understood that the essence of dress, the objective and the intent of dress in Islam is modesty. Mm. We could take the modesty from one place and one time to another and end up with style that improves the diversity. And so the kurta comes up mm. in indo Park, the thobe in Arabia, the suit in America, the lungi in Malaysia and Indonesia, and, um, and, and, and we all are modest. Mm. Now we mustn't try and transport um, our own style mm. across the world. And so if, 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 if someone wears a veil there, we want to do it there. Mm. So, 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 so I think the Makassidi approach is the one mm. that begins to restore the strategic capacity mm. within Muslims because it links our daily actions with our eternal and universal objectives. Values and objectives. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim, I think um, the, the usefulness also of the Maqasidi approach is, I think, enunciated for me in my mind also when we just go back to some of the basic uh, teachings that we have even in the fiqh, in the jurisprudence, etc. Uh, you've mentioned about the strategic approaches and how the Prophet وسلم, looked at uh, perhaps even the outcomes of actions and conduct that is somehow um, uh, fashioned today, what would be its outcomes and, and so because um, if you look at, at, at every, uh, just the rationale and the, and the reason that becomes central in all of these uh, laws etc, uh, the, the ruling itself is, is integrally and inextricably linked to the perceived outcomes. So if something is going to bring about an adverse effect from a very intuitive Sharia, Fiqh perspective, that thing would not be allowed mm. because it will bring about an adverse effect for, for humanity. If something harbors uh, <coughs> maslaha or interest uh, for society, for human beings, it will be highly recommended or it may even become obligatory that you know, that particular um, uh, matter be, be, be brought about as part of the structure within society. And so I think, again, uh, the Maqasidi approach in a sense is probably, in other words, again, looking at the higher purposes of the Sharia ah, is once again, probably also very akin to the whole notion of a very contextual uh, understanding of text um, we look uh, for example uh, uh, ambassador Abraham when we were talking about you know how and this is something quite telling I think it's it's, it's very telling uh, as as an example of a maqasidi approach as well as a, a contextual approach we look at the uh, 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 the relations, uh, the interfaith relations that they are, or the, inter if you wish, even international relations, the guidelines are laid down as normative values in the Holy Quran is very, very clear that there may be a context, and this is the norm, where Muslims find themselves at peace with those around them. But then there's a very clear distinction that is made uh, when Muslims find themselves in a state of hostilities with those around them. And again, as we've mentioned early on, that may become then the exceptional uh, value or the exception to the rule. But what remains the basis is a context of peace. What remains the basis is the understanding that that context may change. And the exception is to restore the norm of peaceful coexistence. Is to restore is to restore. And so I think um, 
for us again, uh, Ambassador Ibrahim, not to perhaps you know hop too much on this particular dimension, but really the challenge that the Ummah faces today in terms of managing those differences. I think if we reflect on the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and, and as you've said, you know, I don't think um, there's even much need for lots of interpretation. It's very explicitly in the example of the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated. It's very explicit in the Holy Quran. I'm thinking about how it is that we can remain aloof of those very powerful expressions in the Holy Quran where Allah Almighty talks of should you fall into factionalism, should you fall into dispute, you will fail, your power will dissipate, and you will decline. Uh, on the contrary to that, or the counter advice to that is, wasbiru, be patient, be, have fortitude, have forbearance, etc., etc. So, Ambassador Ibrahim, I think, the, can we perhaps, again, in, in light of this interregnum, reflect a little bit more in terms of how Muslims perhaps need to understand that when we talk about differences in the Muslim world, the main, I think, important consideration or the important fault line that we must begin to perfect in terms of how we manage these difference, uh, differences is the fault line of Sunni on the one hand and Shi'i on the other hand. I think many of us in positions of leadership begin to highlight and pronounce the areas of differences uh, to such a degree that it really becomes irreconcilable of how the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, dealt with those kinds of differences even uh, in his own example. You see, I think that when you look at the Muslim Ummah, you will see there's 1,6, 1,5, 1,6 billion Muslims in the world today. Then if you were to ask, how can we nuance that 1,6? Then the basic thing is 30% may be Shia and 70% may be Sunni. So 1,6, 70, 30. Split Shia, Sunni. Then you can have a further nuance amongst that because you will have Sufi expressions, particularly across both Shia and, and Sunni. You would have um, traditional other expressions and you would have Wahhabi expressions and so forth and really austere versions mm -hmm. of Shiism um, as, as, as much. But then there's a political delineation that could come in. And I would say that across 80%, 90% of the Ummah spanning both Shia and Sunni are the forces of Wasatiyah. Just the ordinary Muslims right. who love to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, want to follow the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam, want to be able to pray every day and live their lives, sometimes get angry when injustices happen, want to march when brothers in, and sisters in Palestine are in pain and all of those. But that's about 80-90% spanning Shia and Sunni divides. They are the force of Wasatiya. Mm. Then on the edge, the Shia edge, you may have extremists in the Hezbollah mold. And on the other, the Sunni edge, you have the Al-Qaeda's and you have the ISIS who mm. come out of an austere Salafi-based um, Sunni mm. extremism. So if you don't understand the Ummah and break it down like that, we are going to make enormous mistakes. Mm. America makes mistakes by not seeing these subdivisions and these diversity and variety, politically, um, spiritually, and theologically within the Ummah. And therefore, they enrage the entire Ummah when they go and they bomb Afghanistan and they bomb Iraq and they do this and they do that and so forth and make no distinction between Shia and Sunni, make no distinction between Wasati and and, and, and Hamiya and all and, and extremists and so forth and they have the potential to turn everyone into extremists mm. but the same token we can't make that same mistake because mm. we know it and so we know that whoever says la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah has the benefit of the doubt mm. in the same way that they had the benefit of the doubt under the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though they were eventually outed as munafiqun mm. mm. as hypocrites mm. But it is not a state of mind. Mm. 
it is a state of action. Mm. You see, that's the difference. You cannot judge a person on their state of mind. Mm. I remember, and, mm. I, and, I, and, mm. I, and the details escaped me. Mm. After Uhud, which the Muslims had a Pyrrhic victory, two of the Muslims came back late. After the expedition, the rest, the Prophet Sallallahu and they were all in camp already. Mm. And the one told the story of how he had gone after the booty and he was very triumphalist, how he killed this guy, even though this guy at the last moment said, La ilaha illallah. Mm. Mm. And the Prophet Sallallahu mm. mm. re reprimanded him mm. and say, how did you know? Did you cut open his heart to mm. see? Mm. You see, you cannot act against someone mm. on a state of mind. Mm. The Prophet acted against the Munafiku not because they were hypocritical of mind, mm. it was they were treasonous in action. In action. Mm. And if we can get that right, we can avoid an enormous theological battle that while Saudi Arabia and Iran fight it out for dominance of the Middle East, the rest of us are thrown scare stories mm. about what the Shias are doing, what the Sunnis are doing there, how the Shias are going to desecrate the tombs, mm. how they insulted the Prophet, how they thought that Jibreel went to the wrong mm. um, person, he should have gone to Ali and all of this. We will get enraged with that and we will start chasing them out of the masajid, chasing, closing their, 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 their schools, vilifying their persons and all of those kind of things. And the Ummah will never be able mm. to get itself into a position where it can consolidate 1,6 billion people withstand mm. the persecution. Mm. Persevere against what they say. jamila, And give them the face of a beautiful dignity. Mm. What are we showing under pressure? Mm. An angry face that now goes on a witch hunt against Shias, goes on a witch hunt against Sufis, goes on a witch hunt against mm. this one. Those who are not, their, their pants are too, too long, their beards are too short, um, all of that. That's not a face. That's not in response to Wahd Jurhum Hajaran Jamila. Mm. Mm. We are not giving them the face of a beautiful mm. dignity. Mm. We are in fact showing the worst side of us under pressure. Mm. And so, I think we've got to diffuse these theological fires that people are paying to put up mm -hmm. in the interest not of purifying Islam, but of dominance. Mm. Political. Political dominance, mm. geopolitical dominance mm. in the Middle East. Mm. Remember, I think uh, that, that point is just so powerful. You spoke about the state of mind, the state of action. Um, there is even a fiqh maxim, there's a legal maxim to this effect where we know uh, that when it comes to uh, judging and when it comes to judging especially within a worldly context, we can only judge with that in accordance with that which is apparent, that which is manifest. Uh, the, the maxim says, إِنَّمَا نَحْكُمُ بِالظَّوَاهِرِ we may only judge in accordance with that which is manifest and which appears to us outwardly. Wallahu yatawalla as And Allah will take care of that which is concealed. He will take care of the hidden. And so, in a sense, you, your reference even to the munafiqun, and this is also for me very, very powerful. The reference to the munafiqun uh, in Al Madina, we know that they outwardly even sometimes uh, committed treason, but in a worldly court, they were really taken to task for that treason because they always had a sense of a, 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 a legal slight or a legal loophole which they based that action because upon. Because one maqsid can be higher than another one. The maqsid of keeping your agreements is more important than the infraction of betrayal. Absolutely. You see, because if because betrayal may be contextual. It depends on time and space and circumstance. Mm. But keeping your agreements is eternal is and exactly. universal. It is the fitra of a Muslim mm. Mm. that when you say you will enjoy my protection, you will do the maximum to do it because if you break your word there, you can break your word anywhere. 
And that is absolutely crucial. Ambassador Abraham, that opens up an entire new episode for us in terms of considering those values, the hierarchy, of course, of what is even more uh, sort of uh, uh, uppermost in terms of these hierarchy of values, hierarchy of the maqasid, etc., etc. Uh, Professor Ibrahim, uh, uh, Ambassador Ibrahim, it was an absolute pleasure to have you again with us. Uh, we look forward perhaps to another occasion to do so in the future. Wonderful for having you in the studio. That brings us to the end of this particular episode that we are currently requiring to bid farewell to our uh, viewers and our listeners. Thank you very much again for joining us uh, in the IPSA seminar series. Until we meet again on this forum, Assalamu Alaikum and good evening.